Hi, I'm Joe Connolly. Welcome to all of you, including first-time virtual attendees, and also welcome to employees from our sponsor, First National Bank LI. I've missed talking with you over the last year or so. I hope you'll find that this is a uniquely comprehensive business update and ideas program. So let's start with somebody who knows how small and mid-sized businesses are doing by the day because he sees the deposits and the transactions and the loans being made every day. Chris Becker, president of First National Bank LI. Welcome, Chris. Thank you, Joe. Good morning. It's great to be here this morning. We talked a couple of months ago, and I remember you said back then that you thought business was going to spiral up. What are you seeing now, Chris? You know, we, we really are seeing that happen. You know, I think of a few few industries um, where we, we bank a lot of customers and we have in the medical industry, uh, um, home improvement, uh, you know, real estate industry and, and travel and lodging. And from all of them, you know, we're hearing like, for instance, travel and lodging, we're hearing a lot of bookings going on. So obviously that's going to help the uh, Long Island, New York City economy. And what is that going to help? That's going to help the restaurants. And that is then going to help the restaurant suppliers, the purveyors. It's going to help uh, the laundry and, li uh, laundry and linen service businesses. So all of this is just, just all this activity is spiraling up the activity. Obviously on the real estate side, you know, we have uh, painting uh, retailers, we have lumber companies, um, we have local hardware stores and home decor stores, and they're all, you know, benefiting from this great activity going on in the real estate business. What's the biggest change you've seen in some businesses, Chris? Well, we've had some some businesses, longtime businesses that have been very successful. We have a, a company that's very successful in providing the, the cleaning uh, services for um, uh, medical equipment, surgical equipment. And they've opened up uh, a, a new subsidiary, a new line of business where they're now providing um, the, the collection and transport and, and testing for, um, for viruses. So obviously that's coming out of COVID-19, but that's a new business that uh, they'll be able to continue to operate and be able to test uh, uh, many different viruses or, or many different illnesses going forward. So we see companies like that actually starting a new line of business. We see other companies. Um, we have a company that, that provides um, all of the queuing and crowd controls for say airports, things like that. So obviously in this type of uh, pandemic, you know, they've been able to expand, they increase their operations to be able to provide crowd control uh, uh, products to various industries. So we have people adjusting. Another important thing is, is inventory control. You know, costs have been spiraling up. Um, the supply chain issues have caused that. And uh, we've seen people, uh, companies that have gotten to know, you know kind of a just-in-time inventory system, they've actually abandoned that and have been, you know, buying inventory ahead of time, trying to beat the costs going up. Those are great examples of how businesses are expanding into new fields which makes some think that we'll have a boom economy for quite a while. Uh, who knows? But what do you think, Chris? Well, you know, we've been talking to a lot of customers about that. And obviously we talk internally about that in the bank. And customers are very hesitant to really go much beyond, you know, the current year. They think that, that the remainder of 2021 is going to be strong. They're not so sure what 2022 is going to look like, although... Uh, I will say, and some of the contractors are optimistic for the next two or three years. They have they have a tremendous backlog of work, and uh, and they think that this boom could go on for for an extended period of time. What's happening in your industry? Well, the ba banking industry is very interesting. Uh, we you know there's obviously there's been a lot of uh, mergers and acquisitions announced in, in the industry, and even right in our local market uh, here on Long Island, the city. Um, you know, that how is that going to affect businesses? We'll have to see. I always look at it and say, you know, in every industry, there's, there's different size companies that, uh, you know, that help similar size companies. So, you know, the smaller banks quite often help the smaller businesses. And, you know, as the banks get larger, they help the, the bigger multinational businesses and such. So it's going to be interesting to see how all of this, uh, all of this pans out. We feel that, uh, 
that a lot of the small businesses like that, you know, consultative approach, that handholding. They don't want to call an 800 number. Um, so we've been staffing up, um, you know, to be able to provide that service and, and uh, you know, to our customers. So it's it's this ongoing change in the industry. And, um, you know, it, it, it's never dull because there's always, there's always new things coming at us. All right. So you're growing, too. Good to talk to you again, Chris. Thank you for sponsoring today's show. Let's see what our panelists and others say about whether they're growing. I bet they are. And here they are. Here are our business owners. Here are Andy and Lindsay and Alexi. And just so you know, we'll keep this program to less than an hour. And when we're meeting in person, which hopefully we will again pretty soon, a lot of people take notes as they hear the speakers make points that trigger an idea that for them that they can apply to their business. Because at the core, that's the reason for these business breakfasts WCBS has to give you ideas and stimulation and encouragement and bring you speakers you wouldn't ordinarily hear at the routine business meeting. Alexi Nazem is an MD and an entrepreneur whose business was way ahead of the curve in sensing two or three years ago that people were starting to work in different ways. When I heard about Lindsay Lightman's business, Shop Teaks, to put the best boutiques from around the world all online in one place, I thought, what a great idea for smaller businesses everywhere. And I met Andy Jennings virtually. We've got to stop meeting this way again virtually all the time, Andy. We both were on a virtual uh, panel together for Union Catholic High School in New Jersey. And I immediately thought that Andy gets and understands small and mid-sized businesses. So we'll start by asking each of you first to just briefly explain so the people know what your business does. Alexi? Sure. Good morning, Joe, and thank you for having all of us on the panel. Looking forward to this conversation. Um, so our business is called Nomad Health, and we are a healthcare staffing company that uh, leverages technology. So hospitals and all sorts of medical facilities often need surge staffing, um, even outside of pandemic times, uh, to manage their sort of undulating curve of demand, um, uh, of patient demand. And so we are in the business of putting uh, clinicians, nurses, doctors, and others at the bedside uh, whenever they're needed. So we, we, um, we're, we run sort of an online marketplace uh, that connects the hospitals that need to hire clinicians and the clinicians who want to do that temporary work. Um, and, we, and we manage that whole process um, uh, seamlessly online. So it's a far more efficient, scalable um, solution than the people-powered solutions that have uh, driven this market for the last uh, four or five decades before uh, we started our company five years ago. And we want to hear more insights into how the healthcare industry is changing and how other business owners can get in on that action as well. Lindsay. We're so excited to be here and be a part of this session. Um, you know, what started off for Shop Teaks as a mission to have a marketplace connecting amazing local stores around the world with shoppers has grown in the back end to be so much more. We really are, our mission is to help uh, small get smarter. We want to help small businesses really scale digitally and reach their full potential in growing customers and growing revenue. Um, we offer them a suite of services and technologies to help them reach their full potential online and compete with the big guys out there like, you know, Saks, Nordstrom, Farfetch, Revolve, uh, who have much bigger budgets and, and spend than they can possibly have in their lifetime. Wow, small get smarter, great phrase. Andy. Hi, uh, thank you so much for having me. This is really, truly an honor, um, Joe, uh, and just meeting you for the second time again. Can't wait to meet you in person. Um, personally, I have been um, cultivating creative solutions for, for companies, products, schools, nonprofits, um, probably for about the last 15 years. Um, and working with my company, Mad Creek, um, I actually have transitioned to, to keep Mad Creek, but also to work alongside with Mad Creek to to really focus on other aspects of small businesses that maybe 
they didn't think of. We want to see small businesses extend beyond their boundaries to add different services that they never thought of before. And, and at this time in the pandemic to, to be, um, to be a resource for these businesses, whether big, whether small, uh, to, to, we are here for them. Um, we are not afraid of any recessions or pandemics. We believe that small businesses can thrive. And with our creativity and our strategy, advertising, um, digital, social, all of our services, we feel that we can really get involved in the company as part of your company, as your extra set of hands, or as a, as a resource. And, um, and, and we're excited to do so. It's been working out really great this year. That's great. We'll tell you some interesting things about Andy's business, too, as we go along. Now back to each of you, back to each of you, starting with Alexi. How are you planning to grow your business now going into a strengthening economy? Well, so the interesting thing for us is that our business has been growing throughout the pandemic, largely because our business is right at the uh, at the nexus of all the of all the most critical needs of the uh, of the last year. So we've been growing um, in a, at an, un, an extraordinary clip uh, over the last year. So we're just we're not planning to grow. We are in the middle of it. Um, from our perspective, I think there's a there's a few things. Um, one is that we're just hiring a lot. Uh, we are a technology company, so we're constantly hiring lots of uh, technical staff, so um, engineers and product managers and designers, uh, data analysts and scientists. Um, and one of the things that's been very interesting is that so many technology companies over the last year have actually uh, also been in this position that we're in, which is growing so fast that there's been a huge um, uh, acceleration of transformation to technology solutions from uh, non-technology solutions in many industries. Um, and so there has been this uh, war for talent um, in the technical fields. And what that has caused us to do is to broaden our horizons and start hiring people all across the United States. And still the bulk of our staff is based in New York City, but um, uh you know in an all virtual world and in a world where talent is so um uh, uh so uh, hard to find and everyone wants them uh, you really have to open up uh open up where you're looking for 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 high quality high quality people so one of the big one of the big drivers of growth for us is simply going to be um hiring hiring talent uh the demand side of things the demand for our services is just through the roof and so we're just doing this, everything we possibly can to keep up and as I understand it, you put clinicians, nurses mainly at the moment, into jobs in other parts of the country where they may like to go and live for three or four months. Is 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 that so? Who are who are these people? Who who who's yeah. doing that? Sounds great. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. It sounds like a great life, uh, but it's also a heroic uh, profession, so especially mm -hmm. in this past year and a half. So just put simply, what is this business that we're in? So let's talk about travel nursing, which is one of the core businesses that we're in. A hospital might say, we don't have enough ICU nurses to help staff the hospital from August through uh, November. And so we need to get some from, from somewhere else. We can't hire them from our own community, so can we bring them in from somewhere else? And so they'll turn to a company like ours, uh, a marketplace like ours, and seek out um, an ICU nurse who can start on August 5th, and I'm willing to pay them this much, and we need them to work uh, night shifts, and they need to have these qualifications, they need to have you know, ACLS training and uh, critical care nursing certification and a whole bunch of other things. And um, and so they put that, you know, sort of like posting a, a home on Airbnb, they're posting their need on um, uh, onto our network. And on the other side are the people that you're asking about, who are these nurses that want to do this kind of work? So traveling nurses make a career out of being a traveling nurse, or at least um, several years of a career. Um, and it often happens at the beginning of a career. So a young nurse, a few years out of school, wants to sort of uh, see the world, uh, make a little extra money, have an adventure, but also get an, uh, exposure to new types of opportunities. So I've never worked in a rural hospital before. I've never worked in a teaching hospital before. I've never been to Arizona before uh, to see that patient population. Um, and then also people on the tail end of their career, uh, sort of empty nesters who maybe don't want to work 12 months out of the year. They want to work maybe nine months out of the year, but still be, a, still be engaged clinically. And these people will do this kind of work for three to five years at a time and they'll do it's three to five years though of well, like you said three month gig after three month gig after three month gig and um so 
their services have been very needed over the past year. As you can remember, way back when, when we were here in New York um, in March and April of 2020, when we were exploding as a hotspot, nurses like amazingly came from all over America to help out with what was going on here in New York. And, um, and so it was, uh, it was through our company and many others that, um, that we were able to sort of uh, solve that problem. One last question before I get to Lindsay, uh, Alexi. For business owners, what is the area in healthcare and the huge health and home care field where you think there are opportunities for growth for businesses in accounting or business services or professional services to get in, get some clients in the healthcare field? Um, where should well, they look? I think that um, there are a couple of really big trends. I mean, first of all, healthcare is a massively growing industry and has been for a long time, but will be growing so much over the next several years. It's um, uh, largely due to the demographics. The baby boom population is aging into the 65 plus bracket and people over the age of 65 use three times as much healthcare services as people under the age of 65. And 10,000 boomers are turning 65 every day for the next decade. So there is just an explosion in need for all sorts of healthcare services. But if you want to look at some specific trends, one of the things that we saw over the last year was a huge increase in the use of telemedicine. Obviously, we're doing everything virtually in the world now, uh, but um, medicine especially saw an, an enormous growth. So these telemedicine companies are springing up and offering uh, a huge amount of um, high quality service experience, consumerized versions of, of healthcare. Those are really big businesses that are um, uh, growing, uh, many based here in New York City. Um, and so, uh, biz, uh, you know, sort of businesses that want to serve the healthcare industry, that's a great place to look. Um, right. And then of course, hospitals, uh, uh, home health agencies, nursing homes, um, they're not going anywhere and are, um, are uh, only uh, increasingly needed. Right. Services to any part of the healthcare industry are growth. Lindsay, yeah. I bet that your business has started picking up in the last month to six uh, weeks or so. How do you plan to grow into this world where people are dressing up and going out again? Yeah, I mean, so first off, I have to say we experienced something very similar to Alexi. Like we were super fortunate during the pandemic in the sense that you know, it hit and so many of these small business owner, boutique owners had for many years been kind of dragging their feet, kicking their feet, not wanting to go digital, not wanting to go online because their storefront was so important to them. And all of a sudden we had global closures and they were scrambling. They were, you know, we need to have a website. We need to be online. We need to be selling in social. And so our business just boomed through the pandemic. It was, it was massive for us. And so we were so fortunate to have that growth. And um, in a good way, though, they really pushed us to continue to innovate and grow our business. So, you know, on the front end of our business, we have our marketplace where we're selling to consumers. But on the back end, we're really just a services and technology company supplying boutiques and small business owners with everything they need to be successful digitally. So they were all of a sudden challenging our online tech, forcing us to innovate quickly, innovate faster, innovate more, give them more tools, give them more access, give them more customers. And in a great way, it forced us to really think outside of the box and grow. So, I mean, we couldn't, I, I mean, I would never say we're grateful for a pandemic, but um, we're very thankful for the lessons that we've learned and, and the opportunities that we've had thanks to it. Um, I think coming out of this pandemic, we have two very different objectives. And one is for um, shopteaks.com, which is our marketplace. We want to grow. We want to grow fast. We want to help our boutiques access as many customers as possible. And so we're, you know, we're thrilled to see people coming back online shopping. Um, I have to say I'm fascinated by the behaviors of the shopping online now. I'm seeing much higher AOV, much higher spend than we saw pre-pandemic, almost you know, a 20% lift in our AOV post pandemic. A AOV is what? Oh, sorry. Average order value. Okay. So um, we're seeing people spend more per transaction than they were mm -hmm. pre pandemic. And we're sent, we're seeing people finally starting to buy real things again. So they're no longer just buying their, you know, comfy, cozy clothing, their loungewear. They're now buying outfits to go out and accessories and, home goods and gifts for people. And so it's, you know, we're excited to see this world open up 
And on the back end of our business, you know, we we have not slowed down and we have not stopped. We are pushing out new tech every single day. We launched something new last week. We're launching something new in two weeks. So, you know, we're trying to get as many tools and resources in front of our boutique owners to help them compete, because I think this is a real era of an opportunity online. I think we're just at the beginning of retail picking back up and we want to help our small business owners capture as much of it as possible. People right now love supporting local. Just before I get to Andy, uh, one last question, uh, Lindsay. For business owners who were not booming like Alexi's and yours uh, during the pandemic, what would be the thing that they should do that you would suggest to catch up to to you and and, and, and to get online faster or grow now? Yeah. So I think it, I mean, obviously I, I can speak to what I know, which is the retail sector a little bit more than other sectors. So business owners that are maybe restaurants won't find this as relevant, but I think that, you know, I've seen small business owners succeed and fail during the course of the last year. And the one thing that I can say that's helping them succeed is the people that are willing to test anything, to try to take risks, you know, think outside of the box, try something different. Don't be afraid to try to talk to your customers in a new way or offer them different things. And I don't mean discounts. I'm not talking just discount your product. I'm talking, try selling to them in a different way. Try hosting events, try anything you can. Um, but thinking digitally first is really important because customers are not gonna go back to just shopping in store. So you have to have a experience for your customers that's both in store, online, on their phones, most people are gonna be on the go all the time and you need to just be able to help them wherever they are, however they are. Thank you. Andy, where is your course set right now? Uh, our course is set to pretty much continue what we've been doing. Um, we haven't had to change too much during the pandemic. Um, so because of the fact that we are, we're, we were always virtual. So what we decided to do with our customers or our clients or new customers uh, to attract new customers was was explain to them that, you know, while your business is maybe slow or while you're figuring things out, really try to think of other things you've always wanted to do with your business. And what are those things and how can we help you? Um, I always call my team the dream team because not because they're fantastic, but because they we make dreams come true. That's what that's what we do. We know small businesses struggle. We know um, how much they have to do. Um, owners of small businesses have to do. We know how much they have to struggle in terms of keeping their employees and and keeping their store up to date that they can't even really sometimes focus on their own marketing and advertising. So we usually say, Hey, bring us in, give us all of your, your troubles and your woes, whether it's, it could be HR, it could, it could be technical aspects. It could be, um, you know, how to converse with your clients on, on zoom or, or WebEx, um, or how to collaborate with other, other people in your industry in order to work together. We also strategize with them for those types of services. So yes, we are prim primarily design and branding, but what we found ourselves is we are we are much more of a um, a creative pharmacist. We would like to say so if if they come to us with a with a very very unique problem um, or a service that we don't necessarily provide, chances are we're going to research what type of service they need, find the the greatest um, professional in that industry and provide them with all of the tools they need. We almost act sometimes, we acted a lot during the pandemic as a, as a consultant, um, as a trusted consultant uh, to small businesses because they trusted us with our regular services. They would come to us for other um, other needs that they they wanted and, and, and they, again, they trusted us with our information and our vendors and our connections and our relationships. So we're, we, we're all about customer love um, here at Mad Creek. <laughs> that is such a nice and credible uh, description of, of what you do and sincere, uh, Andy. Andy had told me that they were always virtual. And she said that I think your main employees are seven moms and you've been virtual for years. Yes. So you didn't um, have to pivot that way. No. And we, we did have office space uh, for many, many, many years, but it got to the point where um, 
moms are the best multitaskers and especially the, the the women that i have working with me i mean have more than one child and they're just amazing and if we get it done because there's a lot of pressure um back when there was no pandemic you know we were the ones that were doing exactly what a lot of people in the in the business place are doing today at home and no one knew it um so i think it's i think it's great when i'm when i'm on a virtual call and i see a dad you know with their child on their lap and everyone's you know um like going on and over this this beautiful child and we get it like we get that you're a, a person who goes to the office every day and you're trying to run your business and now today you're saddled home with your you know your three kids and you're trying to get it done my team's been doing that for 15, 15 years. So when it went, when it wasn't really popular to do that, we were we were working really hard. So now we feel like we're professionals in in the virtual world, and we can we can work on the go anywhere. Um, we have our talent comes from all over the country. We do not um, pull from just uh, the New Jersey, uh, North Jersey area, and um, so we are able to provide the best services in the industry that match with the client. So particularly um, in, in, in a larger agency when you are in that, um, I would guess you say like in that building atmosphere and you hire you know the, the people on your staff that could be tremendous um, employees. It is, it's great. But when there's a client that comes to you with a very, very unique need, I don't like to pigeonhole them into using the people that we just have. We will, our people will then use their knowledge and their experience and go find them a, a good match, whether it's um, someone closer to them who does, who provides uh, digital or video services um, or, or a service that we don't particularly do in-house. But Andy, most of them, what, yeah. what a great representative <laughs> of, of small businesses today that, that you are. That's just Thank great. You. I want to move along here. Sure. We're going to bring, as we go along, a few contributors to add to this discussion. Here first are Mark and Candy Udell, CEO and president of London Jewelers, very well-known jewelers, on how they have been changing. We were very creative, yeah. you know, in, in our online selling, in Zoom calls. We, we, we created some special events to, you know, bring people aboard uh, when they were sitting home all day. I, I think you have to look out of the box and learn and be creative. And it really helps to have young people on your team, um, next generations that know the world of what's going on today with Instagram and Facebook and TikTok and all those mediums that help you to sell. And um, it's good to have put together a small team and learn from them. In our bank, the First National Bank of Long Island, they were absolutely remarkable during this whole process. Uh, you know, constantly calling us, having calls, how are we doing? Um, the true essence of a, of a bank that cares, um, you know. You, you like just, a family business. Yeah, yeah just amazing how, how they react to us and have been very much part of our growth. Always there, willing and able to do whatever they can to make us um, bigger, better, and stronger. Smarter, stronger, bigger, <laughs> better. These are all becoming the uh, phrases of the day here today. What a nice surprise. Uh, Andy, I want to go back to you, speaking of new things. Um, some of us have not yet used, but soon will use, the new uh, digital whiteboards. <laughs> and I think you were also a pioneer yeah. in that. and. Tell us about your digital whiteboard. And I think you sent us some video to show all the rest of us what this looks like. Sure, it's all a matter of using the tools that you have. So clearly we're, we're a design firm, so we use a lot of Adobe projects. So what we do is we make sure all of our assets are in one place. So when our designers or, or creative um, uh, folk are, are working, we know that right here you'll see, we can pull from the same libraries that you just saw and use them immediately into our, um, our our software. So this way we know everyone who works for me, whether you're a freelancer or independent contractor, 
or as you can see, we have our, our dream team um, WebEx here where we can all share share the screen. We just make sure we are all consistent all the time. So there's never any problems on press. There's there's no problem, um, you know, with our proofing because everyone's using the same the same tools. And and if there's a new tool that we we think is a little bit better, we will try it out. But we have a very very good rhythm um, using Adobe products and using WebEx. And, um, and and that's and and also like a project management software as well. So then, theoretically, everybody knows where every project is at every stage. Is that yes. correct? As yep. if you're on the same building. Yep. And and everyone has their even though um, you know we have several people on set, everyone has their roles clearly outlined. So right. this way, um, we can also we can help each other if if we never go down. That's I guess that's what I would say. We would never really go out of service for any reason. Lindsay, yeah. your website is so good, Thank you. Um, and you're selling clothing from countries all around the world on your website, and you have to get into fittings and sizes. My question when I looked at your website is, what have you learned about making a website as deep as yours, but still appealing and usable and understandable to the customer? Yeah, I mean, I think I think we're still learning. <laughs> I don't think we'll ever stop learning how to sell to the customer. Um, you know, I think right now we're in a really exciting chapter for our website. We're going through a, a very big redesign, actually, that's coming out next week um, and really trying to push a lot of new tech and, and technologies on the site. Like we, you know, I heard Andy say something, but we're not scared to try anything. Like we love to try new things and fail. We think if we fail, you know, at three things and succeed at one, we're a success. Um, you know, so we'll try anything and everything that customers put us put at us. We want to make the shopping experience as seamless as possible. I think what's different for us than a normal e-commerce site is that as a marketplace, we have to make that experience seamless for the shopper, but we also have to make that seamless for the boutique for the seller, because we're really, we're just a facilitator. We just sit in the middle and we help them do what they want to do. So as much as we want to control the experience and the website, we're only as good as the boutiques that are on our site. So where we start is really about sourcing amazing boutiques around the world, making sure they have amazing product, making sure we're helping them get it online. And a lot of times we really feel like we're you know, I, I think Andy said something earlier about being, you know, a, a confidant for them or a, you know, just a, a ear or a new idea. Like we're here to help them. And a lot of times they'll come to us with problems and we're just a facilitator. We're just supposed to help the boutiques get everything they can online. And when it comes to the customer, we try to keep our ears as low to the ground as well. You know, hear what they want, hear what they need to sell. So, you know, one of the things that we heard from our customers was, um, you know, I there's this huge wave going around right now with things like Afterpay and Klarna and Sizzle, this concept of buy now, pay later. And that was really the number one thing that everybody wanted. Um, since launching it, we've seen just phenomenal results. You know, it's all about listening to what people want. And when they ask for it, having the um, ability to adapt and, and try what they're asking for. Alexi, I, I suspect that you have the problem of having to focus more because you could be growing all over the place. Is this a management issue for you to stay in a niche for now until you can grow into the other ones and don't do it too fast? That's exactly right. And that's a problem that I think any uh, company that is uh, starting itself and growing faces. There are so many shiny objects and you have to resist the temptation to pick all of them up. Um, you have to succeed somewhere before you can succeed everywhere. And so um, finding out uh, what that place is um, and focusing there and really going deep is so important. So it is, it's not only a management challenge, it is a whole company challenge. And so we take great pains to um, communicate to our entire staff on a regular basis what it is that we're trying to do, why we're trying to do it, what that strategy is, um, what the strategy is in very great detail. Um, and that allows us to all keep our eyes on the prize. We always want to keep climbing new mountains, um, but you have to be careful because you might dissipate the 
um, the impact of this tremendous amount of resources that you may be uh, able to marshal um, if you put a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit there. So yes, you're absolutely right. We've tried to be quite laser focused. Um, and as you succeed, you earn the right to start taking on new problems. You're also uh, larger, you have uh, more experience, more foundational uh, technology and systems and organizational processes that will allow you to go from doing just one thing to doing two things and then four things and then eight things. And so um, we're, we're thankfully past that you know initial stage where we can really only do one thing, but, um, but still, um, like I said, we're, we, we try to resist the temptation to pick up all the shiny objects. And that is so important. People who've grown large businesses make this point that they had people come to them with great ideas, but they just had to say, I, I, I can't do this now. And uh, well, it's, a, it's a really interesting balance, though, too, because you kind of have to you have to be willing, first of all, to move on uh, as quickly as possible. So, I mean, Lindsay made the interesting point about, you know, we consider ourselves a success if we fail at three things that succeed at one. And that's absolutely right. You have to be willing to try different stuff and fail fast um, so that you can learn that, OK, this is an area that probably is not right for me, but you have to try multiple things. Um, so you can't you can't be persistent uh, on the wrong thing. You have to be able to recognize that you're that you are failing or this isn't working. And there's kind of this sort of like breathing motion where there's inhaling and exhaling, where you want to you want to widen out. You want to try more things. You want to sort of because it, there's it's the it's the um, you know ultimate amount of hubris if you just say I know this is the one thing that we must do. Uh, you should you basically say look I'm gonna puts a few things out there, see what gets traction, and then really lean hard into the thing that is that is getting traction. So it's a it's a real balance and and um, and something that I'm sure all of us on this call and, and many business leaders are always struggling with, which is how do you expand, how do you focus? Here's somebody whose business is very busy as well. Our next contributor is in the booming home remodeling and home improvements business. Michael Aboff of Aboff Painters. Try getting them on the phone. Here's what he's up to. This year is, is robust. People are, are you know, fixing their homes. There's a lot of transactions going on with the, when people sell a house, they tend to fix it up and paint it. And when they buy a house, they tend to, they said, oh, we have to change it. And, you know, they, you know, they tend to paint it again. So, uh, you know, it, it's been a very good, uh, economy for us. We're very lucky and fortunate. You know, in our business, you just can't bring someone in, stand behind a cash register and uh, tell them to start. You know, there, there's expertise that people need to know. Paint is a chemical. So there, there's definitely a learning curve. We are hiring people who have been in some other kind of managerial positions and other types of retail that is not as fared as well. And there's a training period that we can bring them up to speed. But I think uh, it's just, I think business in general on Long Island is busy. And the people that, you know, that we're competing for in, in these, uh, these jobs are also, uh, you know, looking for people. So I think there's a shortage right now. Um, and, you know, hopefully that, that'll abate. We're definitely... Uh, always looking, and we're starting people at higher rates than we used to, for sure. You know, talking, hearing a contractor talk reminds me of a question that often comes up when hands are raised around the room uh, when we hold the breakfast in person. So I throw this out to any of the three of you. How do you react to competitors who underprice you mm -hmm. for painting or professional services or whatever it is? You know, I think we see this, uh, I mean, not necessarily undercutting my costs for my business, but more for our small business owners. It happens every day and all the time. You know, they're carrying a lot of labels and brands in their store that are carried at bigger chains. And it's very difficult for a small business owner who's working on much tighter margins than a, than a large retailer because their costs are constantly undercut. 
not only are their costs undercut, but their policies are less favorable. You know, they have very rigid return policies. A lot of them are store credit only or, you know, return within seven days compared to 30, 60, 90 at these bigger retailers. So I think it's something that's very much on their mind. And the only way to compete with that is really to diversify your product and find unique and different brands. You, you just can't win against those big retailers, unfortunately. Andy, any experience with that? Yes, a lot. Um, and what, but because we we try to really understand these, these small businesses, we understand their budgets are, are, are much smaller compared to our larger clients that have, um, you know, budgets that they need to spend before the certain end of a quarter or something. So we, with those small clients, typically we will, we will tell them um, that we're going to estimate with our actual costs. If it's something that they, you know, can't afford. We certainly try to work with them. Most of the time we can't. So they- Most of the time uh, you can. They We can, but they yeah. choose not to. And and I have I have to say most of the time they come back <laughs> because, you know, a lot of times they're, they're going to find like cheaper, you know, online outlets with people that, that don't know their business, that don't care about their business, but they're just running out there because they need a logo or they need a landing page. And then nothing really is cohesive or foundational enough to build on. So the money that they're spending out there on these, you know, one shot deals really does not help them grow foundationally. So we try to tell them that we try to educate them, but we absolutely give them the option to do whatever we want. There are no, no high pressure sales at Mad Creek. Alexi, do you have new competitors coming up on your tail or th does this affect you in your booming business? Of course, I mean I think competition is um, so natural in any in any business that if if an idea is worth doing, you're going to have competitors. If you don't, you should be worried. Um, so, um, <clears throat> on on the point of of uh, prices and undercutting, I think that price is merely one lever that can be pulled to win business, and sometimes it's a sometimes it's the right lever to pull, and other and it's worth engaging in a um, you know. I, I, I hesitate to say it's worth engaging in a price war because it's almost never worth it. But um, <clears throat> but I think that uh, recognizing the other aspects of your business that are very um, appealing to your customers is is how you uh, not only survive but thrive in that kind of situation. Focusing on experience, for example, um, is is an extremely important thing. People will be willing to pay more for something that they think is a better quality product or service, and so. Um, you know, focusing only on one leg of that business stool, the price is not um, is not a wise is not a wise choice. It is so easy because it's very quantifiable. Um, but the uh, but the other uh, but the other parts of running a business, I think, are are just as if not more important. Um, obviously, if you can offer a better service at a better price, then you have a really winning combination, and that's what you're seeing with a lot of uh, a lot of technology disruptions in um, uh, you know in industries that have typically not seen a lot of technology. And so that kind of undercutting of price really is um, not only sustainable, but potentially fatal to the business that is being undercut. Exactly. I, I can, Sorry, go ahead. I just add, you know, add to that. Um, we actually learned a lesson from, from one of our clients years ago in, in a recession, instead of pulling back on their marketing and advertising, we were so, um, thrilled that they chose not to do that. They chose to, to pour it into that marketplace to show people that they were not, they were not going anywhere. They were strong. They were, they were not failing. They, they kept out there, they kept in the forefront. So while other businesses and other schools were pulling back on their marketing budgets and, and kind of going away for a while because they, they couldn't afford the advertising or that's not where they wanted to um, appropriate their, their funds. This school was, going full force and it, it paid off tremendously for them. So my advice to a small business would be when, the, when you think that your marketing budget is the first thing to pull back, chances are it's, it's, um, it's understandable, but really, really think about that because the more you show the public that you are a strong company, the better it's going to be for you in the long run. And Alexi, I think you made a really good point, which is it's not just about price. It's also, there's other things on the table you have to consider. And, 
from our for our services and our and our technology side of our business a lot of what we offer like there's other companies out there doing the same thing maybe even doing it better in, in some aspects but really the benefit add that we bring is our relationship and the one thing that we win at every single time is that we are not just a vendor that you're going to bring on your site like we are a partner we're a true connector to your business like we, we think of ourselves as one of your employees and if we didn't have that relationship and that value add and that strategy that we give them i mean during COVID, i even had phone calls with people where i was teaching them how to use zoom and how to use computers and you know we really will do anything for them teaching them how to use facebook or whatever they need and that value add goes far further than the extra little price they might have to pay it makes it worth it for them Nothing against big companies. They have tremendous resources and tremendous contacts. But as I listen to all of you, and especially uh, Lindsay and, and uh, Andy, say we will be your partner, it just sounds so believable. And a big corporation, I think, no matter how hard they try in advertising, cannot make that come across the, the way that a business owner does. And as usual, when we have these events in prog in uh, person, we have to start moving them along at a faster pace toward the end. So I want to get in one more uh, contributor, CPA Ernest Smith of Naraki and Smith, on what they have been seeing and doing in the financial and accounting business. What I do is I provide my existing clients, and we have a large base of clients, non-for-profit and for-profit entities, that qualified for a PPP loan, and we made that expertise available to help them determine and working in conjunction with many of the different banks, including First National Bank of Long Island, in identifying how much they were eligible for. Now we're working through, um, as this program has now gone through the almost an entire year, we're now working through forgiveness and what I said before, the um, employee retention credit. And speaking of money and finances, Alexi, I wanted to ask you about this. You have raised uh, money, uh, uh, considerable amounts of, of uh, funds for your fast-growing business. What advice do you have for people who are maybe not going to Wall Street or financiers for money, but just who are looking for some backers locally or regionally or trying to find some money uh, to uh, grow their business? What do you suggest? One thing holds true, uh, regardless of who you're raising money from, and that is you have to have a very clear explanation of what your business is going to do, why it will win, and how it is going to provide a return to that investor. Because any investor is um, looking to, um, to turn their small amount of money into more than that small amount of money, and being able to clearly demonstrate the qualitative and quantitative um, uh, ways in which uh, your business will help them turn that small investment into a large return is the, is the fundamental responsibility you have as the person seeking that uh, seeking that capital investment. And so, it's going to um, be real clear. I remember the first time I went to a pitch uh, uh, presentation, the business owners made their uh, presentation. First hand goes up among the twenty or so people there. What's your exit strategy? That's <laughs> yeah. all I wanted to know. And, and to be honest, there doesn't need to be an exit necessarily, especially <laughs> for small businesses, which are meant to be uh, cash generative and create distributions for the owners as well as the investors. And, and that's perfectly fine. But I think you need to know your numbers. You need to know how you're going to make money. You need to know what your costs are. You need to know what, what your uh, profits are. You need to understand the fundamentals of your business, the unit economics, all of that stuff. And if you don't know that, you're not going to be able to explain it, and no one's going to feel comfortable giving you that money. And the one thing I would say about raising money from, from local communities, it might be similar to raising angel investment um, uh, for, uh, for sort of high growth tech companies, is that when you approach people, especially friends and family, you need to think about um, this person is uh, taking a big bet on you, so you have to give them all this uh, background information and, and confidence and trust, but you also have to not try to take money from people who can't afford to lose it because there is a very good chance that you will. Um, and oh, so, oh boy, I never heard that one before. There you go. <laughs> um, so, I, I want to go to producer Neerle Caruso with a couple of questions that he has taken that have come in. 
Neil, what do you have there? Well, thanks, Joe. And so, you know, people are asking us what types of new digital content are working for, you know, your clients now. And, you know, frankly, that some consumer behaviors have changed. How do you approach digital content in this pandemic, post-pandemic, hopefully, world? I, I can jump in there. I mean, I, our whole business is predicated on the uh, on shifting behavior. So the idea that people are less interested in white glove uh, handholding and, and service and more interested in self-service. And we've definitely seen that to be true in, um, in the last year and a half. It also happens to be the case that uh, if you want to scale very quickly, um, you know, white glove service is, is le uh, less uh, is less scalable. So um, what we've seen from a digital content perspective is, is that if you can emphasize um, self-service, transparency, ease of use, um, that speaks very much to pretty much every cohort of, of um, potential customer, especially, you know, <clears throat> 40 and younger. You know, we've also leaned into the self-service. We've always been a white glove kind of situation. And exactly what you said, Alexi, it's not scalable. We couldn't scale at that rate. Now, we'll still offer that service to people that need it, that need the handholding. And that's very common with our boutique owners. They're just not digitally savvy. But we also had to quickly innovate and create a self-service platform where boutiques that wanted to join and could sign up could do it on their own without talking to us, without having to go through a lengthy thing. So I think, I mean, I think you nailed it right there. Like people, especially in the 40 under demographic, they're used to doing everything online. They're used to doing everything on their own. And quite frankly, they prefer it. They don't really want to have our their hand held as much. Good one. Neil, got another one there. Yeah, sure. And, um, you know, Joe and I have honestly been hearing from a lot of retail owners and, you know, they're having difficulty finding new customers. So, you know, their stores aren't as busy anymore. Um, they're trying to find new customers online. So the question really for everybody here is how do you find new customers online? And what would you tell those retailers who are having difficulty doing that? And just where do you start? For, for us, um, we, we practice what we preach. So if we're, if we're the type of, we are the service industry that tries to help new businesses either start or grow. So clearly we have our social media presence and our web presence. Um, and we work those hard with, um, with, with, different uh, directions of our advertising. But um, mostly, to be quite honest, we find that user-generated content is is very important. And that's really when other people speak for you. So we, we've, we've also informed our clients of this and we try to get them to, I wouldn't say necessarily like testimonials, but do some type of testimonial advertising where people are speaking on your behalf because with, with all this, the, of the studies that we've done, people, especially the younger generations, are more likely to trust someone's opinion that they know than the actual company themselves. So if we can, we can help the company to, to get others to promote them and speak for them in some way, whether it's with collaboration, partnerships, um, sponsorships, uh, that's really, really what we, what we explain to our customers. And we do the, and we do the same. That's interesting. That says a lot. Lindsay? Yeah, I mean, I think we we definitely rely heavily on on word of mouth from our boutiques. We find that typically boutique owners know other boutique owners. They're they're kind of like a cult. They once they once they open, they all kind of congregate together and know each other. So we find that the best way for us to get new boutiques into our fold is through the word of mouth and other boutique owners. Now, when it comes to customers for shop teaks, of course, we play in all the fields. You know, we do affiliate marketing, we do social media. You know, I think for us, the, the social media marketing is super clouded and inundated. And um, even when we're advising our boutiques whose social media strategy we run for them as well, you know, we, we try to advise them against doing a lot of ads and stuff in Facebook just because there are other people in the space already paying a lot of money. And unless you have a lot to throw behind that, it's really hard to acquire customers there. So just trying to think outside of the box, doing things differently than what the big retailers are doing so you can get the other customers out there. And how do you get that big impact without spending the big bucks? I just want to understand, Lindsay. Yeah. So, I mean, we we really do shy strongly away from social media marketing. I mean, we, we put content out there as you have to, but we don't do a lot of paid ads or promoted posts or anything like that in, in social media because the margins are really tight and the competition is really stiff. 
And so we would rather throw our budget into other things. So we actually rely really heavily on affiliate marketing for us. It's a really big channel for us, just kind of because it's a, it's a, you only pay for what you get. So, you know, there's little risk in it. So it's a really great source. Um, we, it's, it's ironic, but for us, our customer base responds really well to SMS and email marketing still. To what? Um, email marketing, I know a lot of people say is phasing out, but for to us- what, what, Lindsay? They, they, they respond what to well, to what well? Uh, text marketing and text email marketing, marketing. Yeah. SMS. Sorry. Um, so we do a lot of text marketing to them and email marketing. They really love us putting forth trends and being like a, a thought provider as to what they should shop. And that's where we see the best results. Interesting. What works on your site, Alexi? I see you have, I think you have testimonials and reviews. Yeah. I mean, so uh, we, we also are do omni channel marketing. I think the, Sort of important meta point though is that you really need to understand um your business and then make the appropriate choices for your business it's not a one size fits all facebook marketing might be for one company but awful for another you know uh affiliate marketing might be awful for one company and amazing for another so just understanding who your customers are where they are how they get their information wh what influences their decision is so important so actually surveying your existing customers and understanding how they um, uh, how they found out about your business is a very important activity. Um, and, uh, you know, some sort of like uh, axiomatic things about marketing, understanding that it's very different to market to businesses as a customer than individuals as customers. So just understanding those things is, is extremely valuable. From our perspective, um, we take a very data-driven approach because we're dealing with lots and lots and lots of customers on both sides of our marketplace. And so uh, we're constantly uh you know looking at the return on that marketing spend so um you know does google facebook linkedin you know bing whatever or testimonials word of mouth referral codes which ones are really generating um which ones are generating a good return which ones are not and then we you know adjust our spend uh, accordingly you know somebody mentioned to me the other day i hadn't thought of it in this way we've been hearing we've always heard about reinventing your business but now we all have the opportunity to reinvent or reimagine our customers. We have the data, the demand is out there. I, I just thought that was an interesting way of thinking about reinventing your business by reimagining your customers. Do you have new customers coming in from out of the blue, any of you? Yes, absolutely. Um, it's it's the people that took the time in the pandemic to focus on really what they wanted to do in their lives. And it may be something that was completely not in their wheelhouse with the job that they're doing now, whether that they wanted to open a new business, expand their business, write a book. Um, um, we're designing children's books. We're, we're doing so many more things. Um, that are completely out of their comfort zone, but not out of ours. And it's it's such a pleasure to make those dreams come true for people and hope, and then eventually take them through the marketing steps. We don't just stop at just designing what they want us to design. We then show them how to grow that that new part of their world. Final advice, Lindsay and Alexi. Lindsay? Oh gosh. Um, <laughs> I guess just, you know, really understand what, what it is you're trying to sell and, and who you're trying to sell to, I think is super important. And then being not being afraid to think outside of the box and try something untraditional. I think unique wins every time. Barbara Corcoran says that too. She says, she told us that she does these crazy things, not that everybody would want to do that, just to see what works and then there's, there's no yeah. cost. She calls the I, internet uh, the greatest free marketing tool ever <laughs> invented. I like, love it when a boutique comes to me with a wild idea. Like we'll we'll try anything, even if it's not something we offer or service we offer. Like we will do anything and and test anything because I love to learn and I love to grow. And um, I think everybody should. When you stop learning, you stop living. Alexi, I think Lindsay got it exactly right. You should really listen to your customers. Um, a lot of great ideas come come from uh, come from them, and in fact, they're buying from you. So you better give them the things that they want. Um, I think in this time that we're living, it's really important to recognize that there have been really fundamental transformative shifts in the way that the economy works. And um, maybe your business doesn't need to change. Maybe it was well equipped for this new, uh, new world as much as it was for the old one. But uh, taking a good hard look at how you operate 
um, and maybe needing to make fundamental changes, maybe needing to make superficial changes. But if you don't even think about doing anything to change, uh, to account for the fact that the world has changed, uh, you know, you're, you're likely going to be left behind. So keep innovating. Um, and my, my final piece of advice is really follow the data there. We live in this rich world, this rich world of data and, um, it has the answers in it. So you should just, you should really look there. What a different tone there has been in this virtual breakfast compared to the last few. It's great. To, it's just wonderful to hear. And thank you, Alexi, Lindsay, Andy, very much for sharing all your best ideas and, and your insights. Thank you all very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Joe. Thanks for having me. Thank you for watching. These breakfasts have become a passion of mine because they help business owners know what other business owners are doing. And business owners are so generous in sharing their experience and what they've learned. So thank you to Chris Becker and First National Bank LI. Thank you to WCBS News Director, Tim Scheld, and to producer Neil Caruso, who worked on a lot of the details of all of this. I always close the June CBS Business Breakfast by saying, have a good summer. But this year, we'll close by saying, have a much better summer this year. Talk to you on the radio.